All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Live Valuation. I'm Midas Moriarty, and today we're going to be taking a look at ticker EAF, uh, Graph Tech International. Give me one moment to check a few of the stream settings. Make sure everything is up and running. Okay. There's the poll uh, reading sheet out. I didn't pull that out yet. Need that later. Go over to the second screen. Okay. So Graph Tech been uh, looking at this one for a little while. Been meaning to make a DCF for, for some time now uh, but here we are today uh, they are a producer of of graphite uh, electrodes used in the uh, production of various electronic parts and semiconductors basically they use um, a large amount of carbon as well as uh, what are they called? Um, now the now the terms are are like totally my my mind. Um, uh, God damn it! Petroleum. There, there's a, a a certain petroleum byproduct. Uh, God damn it! Why is the words not coming to my mind for the specific shape of the the petroleum? Petroleum coke. Yeah, that's what it is. Damn it! So like, just look it up since I was already <laughs> looking at this earlier. Petroleum coke. Couldn't remember the word for it. Um, one of the byproducts of petroleum processing is a a highly baked on carbon process of, of petroleum coke, uh, as it says here, carbon rich solid material that derives from oil refinery, uh, referred to as coke. So the usage of these uh, petroleum cokes, along with a high amount of carbon in order to uh, produce graphite electrodes. We have the electrodes down here, yeah. Graphite electrodes carry the electricity that melts scrap iron and seals, sometimes direct produce iron and electric arc furnaces, otherwise known as EAFs, hence the, the ticker. That's actually where they got that name. Electric arc furnacings, which are used in the vast majority of steel furnaces. Uh, so essentially, this is a, a company that has a, a, a pretty interesting a pretty interesting competitive space in uh, the the processes of building uh, semiconductors at, uh, at a stage that's a little bit closer to the natural resources involved. So it is a commodity company, but it is, or it's a commodity, uh, a commodity dependent company. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a commodity company. They don't sell a commodity, but we are going to treat them like it's a commodity company in the sense that uh, we're going to correlate the revenues. Uh, to a commodity and we're we are going to use oil specifically oh, my room. We're using oil specifically since um, their ability to To uh, produce electric arc furnace material app is dependent on the pricing of petroleum The higher the level of the petroleum prices the higher that they're going to have to charge for the revenues to cover their costs um, which is a little bit backwards from the normal way that we handle commodity companies because usually the idea is that they're selling the commodity then therefore the revenues are much more directly based on that um, i kind of went back and forth on how to treat this one because you could have argued that the price of steel would have been a more accurate uh a more accurate revenue driver since that's closer to the item that they're actually selling um but i i was doing i was doing correlations against both of them and i decided that it made more sense uh it made more sense to me. Hold on a second. It made more sense to me to correlate across the the main cost driver for them. Uh, now let me look at what is happening with the revenues. I thought I had already. In statements G eight. 
Why did the formula? Where's the formula? Oh, I didn't realize that this got deleted. I must have, uh, yeah, I must have accidentally erased that when I first went onto the page. So you're like, where, where did the, the formula go? Anyway, back to what I was saying. Sorry, I accidentally deleted a, a square and it was kind of throwing everything for a loop. But anyway, as I was saying, so if you take a look at the correlation between it, um, I did a correlation against their the stock price and the revenues uh, against steel, and there was basically only negative correlations to be found. Now there's only a relatively low positive correlation to be found against the revenues for petroleum, but I'm gonna take the positive uh, correlation over a non-correlation. Uh, so that's that's basically my logic for how I'm uh, using the, the, the commodity pricing uh, method to come up with my revenues for them. I'm, I'm gonna use petroleum, it isn't, uh, quite the standard way of going about these things because like I said it is more about their costs than it is about their revenues but they are going to base the revenue pricing based off of the cost that they had to incur in the long run so I'm going to say that this is the best that we can deal with so based off of oil prices of anywhere from $27 a barrel to $182 a barrel we end up with uh, revenue outputs of, for, of this of 973 million to possibly 1.6 billion uh, which you can see this is well, 1.9 if you include the the high-end measure, but Hold on a second Got to turn the commodity pricing correlation on. Okay. So there, yeah. So that gets us to our our, our revenue expectations of anywhere from nine hundred seventy four million to possibly one point six uh, billion. Now we'll, we can move on to actually doing the rest of the financial statement. And I'll play their second quarter earnings call while I work. Welcome to the GraphTech second quarter 2021 earnings conference call and webcast. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. Please be advised that today's call is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star zero. Thank you. I would now like to hand the conference over to Wendy Watson, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to GraphTech International's second quarter 2021 conference call. On with me today is Dave Rintoul, GraphTech's Chief Executive Officer, Quinn Coburn, Chief Financial Officer, and Jeremy Halford, Senior Vice President, Operations and Development. Dave will begin with a review of our safety performance current industry conditions, and our demand and production levels. Jeremy will discuss operational matters and give an update on our ESG initiatives. Quinn will cover financial details, and Dave will close with final remarks and open the call to questions. Turning to our first slide. As a reminder, some of the matters discussed on this call may include forward-looking statements regarding, among other things, 
results, performance, trends, and strategies. These statements are based on current expectations and are subject to risks and uncertainties. Factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those indicated by forward-looking statements are shown here. We will also discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures, and these slides include the relevant non-GAAP reconciliation. You can find these slides in the Investor Relations section of our website at www.graphtech.com. A replay of the call will also be available on our website. I'll now turn the call over to Dave. Thank you, Wendy. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our second quarter earnings call. I hope you, your families, and your colleagues are all well. We begin, as we always do, with safety. Our year-to-date total recordable injury rate is 0.43 through the end of the second quarter, indicating our continued focus on the safety of each and every team member. Health and safety excellence is a core value of GraphTech. As you can see from this chart, we have made meaningful improvement over the last few years, and our ultimate goal is zero injuries with every employee going home safely every day. Our team continues to be diligent and thorough in our COVID-19 controls and protocols. I am proud of the GraphTech team and thank each of you for your continued focus and vigilance. Now turning to slide four, Industry conditions remain positive across key indicators. We continue to see improvement in both pricing and capacity utilization rates in the global steel markets during the second quarter. Steel industry pricing continues to increase with most types of steel at or near all-time highs. U.S. hot rolled coil values are currently over $1,875 per ton up $375 over, over an additional 25% since we reported first quarter 2021 earnings. The global steel manufacturing utilization rate outside of China was 75% in the second quarter compared to 73% in the first quarter of this year and 56% in the second quarter of 2020. In the U.S., the steel industry utilization rate improved to 80% in the second quarter from 77% in the first quarter of this year and continues to move upward. Global steel production outside of China was approximately 221 million tons in the second quarter of 2021 compared to approximately 216 million tons in the first quarter according to the World Steel Association. The continued improvement in the global steel industry utilization rates, along with the normalization of steel producer inventories of graphite electrodes, is driving increased demand for graphite electrodes across geographies. As a result of the increased demand, we are seeing a steady improvement in graphite electrode pricing after bottoming in the first quarter of this year. We are also seeing rising market prices for petroleum needle coal. The strong graphite electro demand and rising prices continue to provide us with confidence in our outlook for higher realized non-LTA prices in the second half of 2021 and our expectation of continued improvement into 2022. As I mentioned, we are experiencing strong demand for our products and our commercial team remains focused on providing superior services and solutions to our valued customers in this improving environment. We have not changed our estimates for graphite electrode sales and volumes under our LTAs. Now turning to slide six. We are pleased with the sequential and year-over-year -year improvement we delivered in our second quarter production and sales volumes. In response to strong demand for our graphite electrodes, we produced 44,000 metric tons of electrodes in the second quarter, up 22% compared to the first quarter and 33% compared to the second quarter of 2020. Sales volumes of graphite electrodes rose, 43, rose to 43,000 metric tons in the second quarter, up 16% compared to the first quarter and 39% compared to the second quarter of last year. 
Our second quarter shipments were comprised of 27,000 metric tons of graphite electrodes under our LTAs at an average approximate price of $9,500 per ton and 16,000 metric tons of non-LTA sales at an average approximate price of $4,100 per metric ton. As a reminder, the pricing we recognize in sales and income lag negotiated prices. Thus, the second quarter $4,100 per ton average of non-LTA pricing represents price negotiations that actually took place in late 2020 and early 2021. Net sales in the second quarter increased 18% compared to the second quarter of 2020 to $331 million. I'll now turn the call over to Jeremy to discuss operating items and our ESG progress over the past quarter. Jeremy? Thanks, Dave. During 2021, we've been enhancing our capabilities across our manufacturing footprint. For example, we're investing in a pin production line at our St. Mary's, Pennsylvania facility that will be online in the third quarter. This diversifies our pin capability and provides production flexibility. Also, with increased demand for our graphite electrodes, we continue to be very focused on further improving efficiencies in our manufacturing facilities and staffing appropriately to meet the demand. Turning to slide seven, we continue to make good progress with our ESG efforts along several paths. Notably, in the second quarter, we completed a full materiality assessment with the assistance of external experts to identify and prioritize the key ESG issues for our business and our stakeholders. The process allowed us to objectively determine the ESG topics that will drive our sustainability strategy, reporting, and actions moving forward. The assessment included peer and industry benchmarking, a robust series of interviews with internal and external stakeholders, and a full validation of the assessment by our executive team. Slide seven shows the current key material topics to GraphTech's business and stakeholders, including climate and energy, innovation, material sourcing, and product quality. From here, we plan to set the goals that will drive our performance relative to each of the material topics. Also, we plan to publish our second annual sustainability report during the third quarter. We hope you will find it useful and informative and welcome your feedback as we continue on our ESG journey. Now, let me turn it over to Quinn to discuss our second quarter financial results on slide eight. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. We're very pleased with our second quarter financial performance. We earned net income of 28 million or 11 cents of GAAP earnings per share which included the impact of a one-time pre-tax change in control charge of $88 million. That was triggered when the ownership of our largest stockholder, Brookfield, fell below 30% of our total shares outstanding. This charge is comprised of a $15 million non-cash expense related to the acceleration of certain previously granted equity awards and a $73 million cash charge triggered triggered under our long-term incentive compensation plan. Of the 73 million cash charge, 61 million was paid in the second quarter. The remaining 12 million relates to employee and employer payroll taxes and will be paid in the third quarter. <clears throat> Excluding these change in control items and other typical quarterly adjustments, our adjusted EPS was 43 cents and adjusted EBITDA was 160 million. Our cash flow also continued to be strong in the second quarter. We generated 86 million of operating cash flow and 74 million of free cash flow. These amounts included the 61 million cash payment triggered by the change in control. Excluding this payment, our adjusted free cash flow was 136 million. We continued to achieve strong free cash flow conversion with 85% of second quarter's adjusted EBITDA converted to adjusted free cash flow. Now turning to slide nine. We continue to strengthen our capital structure in the second quarter with a $50 million reduction in our term loan that matures in 2025. Through the end of the second quarter, our total year-to-date debt reduction is 200 million and our total debt to adjusted EBITDA 
improved to 1.9 times. Notably, over the past two years, we have reduced our long-term debt approximately 800 million from approximately 2 billion in the second quarter of 2019 to approximately 1.2 billion in the second quarter of 2021. At the end of the second quarter, our total liquidity was approximately 360 million, consisting of 114 million of cash and 246 million available under our revolving credit facility. Now turning to slide 10, we're very pleased with the strong earnings and cash flow we delivered in the first half of the year. We expect the significant cash flow generation to continue through the balance of 2021. As we have previously reported, we plan to use the majority of that cash flow to further reduce debt. Our continued focus on a strong capital structure provides us with significant financial, operational, and strategic flexibility as we position the company to capitalize on improvements in the market. We are maintaining our full year 2021 capital expenditure outlook of 55 to 65 million. We will use these funds to support our high quality, low cost global operating assets and to target high return operational improvements. Now I'll hand it back to Dave on slide 11. Thanks, Quinn. I will wrap up with some comments on our favorable positioning in the market. GraphTech is one of the largest producers of ultra-high power graphite electrodes in the world. Graphite electrodes are a mission critical component to the EAF steel industry, and there is no substitute for our product. <clears throat> we have an en enviable customer base comprised of the lowest cost producers of steel. We are some of the largest recyclers in the world, producing steel with 75% less carbon emissions compared to traditional integrated steel producers. And the EAF steel industry is committed to taking their leadership in sustainable steel production even further, innovating to increase efficiency, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and reinforce material reuse and recycling. As we look forward, we are committed to helping our industry further advance these sustainability initiatives. From its leading position, we expect the EAF in steel industry growth to continue to outpace global GDP over the long, long term positioning our products for solid long-term growth. The recovery and strength of the steel industry is having a positive impact upon demand and pricing in our business. And we expect increasingly to increasingly benefit from these favorable trends in the second half of this year and into 2022. We have a sustainable and long-term competitive advantage from our low cost structure and vertical integration into our key raw material petroleum needle coat. Our graphite electrodes are highly engineered and require extensive process knowledge to manufacture. The services and solutions that GraphTech provides help position both our customers and our company for a better future. Our commitment to balance sheet strength and our proven track record of high quality earnings and significant cash flow generation gives us flexibility to successfully manage through industry cycles. With the commitment of our people and our significant competitive advantages, we continue to strongly believe GraphTech is well positioned to deliver results today and over the long term. This concludes our prepared remarks and we'll now open up the call for questions. Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask an audio question, press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, that is star one for questions. Your first question comes from the line of Arun Viswanathan with RBC Capital Markets. Great. Thanks for taking my question. Um, hope you guys are well. So I guess, you know, first off, um, just wanted to ask about pricing here. You, you noted, you know, obviously very robust uh, hot roll prices. Um, you know, uh, well over 1,800. Um, uh, you know, we're reading that you know possibly could even get to 2,000 next month. Um, but uh, if if you look at the production and sales volumes for for uh, GraphTech, um, you know, volume was up 39% in the last year, and and net sales are up 18%. So that would imply that pricing is is negative. Um, I guess you know, what's it going to take for for Graph 
graphite electrode pricing here to, to start to turn around. I, I know that there is typically a lag uh, from the steel markets, but um, it seems like conditions are pretty tight. You know, you've mentioned very strong demand. Um, you know, what is the outlook for pricing? And, and, and when, when pricing does start to turn positive, do you expect, um, you know, an environment where we could potentially test the highs uh, that we saw in 2017-18, or is it going to be more measured? Thanks. Oh, Arun, um, thanks for your uh, question. I think the best way to think, to think about this is to, to remember uh, and setting the base here that as we progressed into the first quarter of this year, we at that time, I think, shared with everybody that there was inventory on the ground and there was a bit of an inventory hangover that had to be worked through, which by the end of the first quarter, uh, we had done that, uh, stated that, and shared with people that we felt that the pricing mechanisms in the, in the industry had bottomed out, you know, uh, early in that quarter. Our experience has been exactly that. We absolutely expect the third and fourth quarter pricing to be uh, higher than uh, what we experienced in the first or second quarter. The only reason you see that small decline is that some of the products that were delivered in the second quarter were negotiated in January when we were at the bottom. So they influenced that average weighted price and please also recognize that the mixture between LTAs, we sold more non-LTA business in the second quarter. So that has an impact of lowering the average weighted price because of the impact of the mix between the number of tons of, of LTA and then the increased number of tons of spot. And that's all good. It's, it's referencing the fact that the market has been improving. So, um, Please be rest assured that the comments we've made earlier will come to fruition in the second half of the year. Our reported pricing and realized pricing of non-LTA pricing will absolutely be higher in the second half of the year. And we think that the um, supply and demand relationships that are evolving this year will uh, uh, lead to continued improvement as we move into 2022. Uh, I, I actually can't be more positive about that um, without, you know, we're not, we, as we always, we don't provide guidance, so I can't go there, but um, we are quite um, happy about the way the market is unfolding. And just to, um, thanks for that. Um, I guess just to, to follow on here, so, Looks like your spot prices are kind of in that, you know, as you noted, forty-one hundred dollar um, range. But that was, uh, you know, uh, based off of earlier discussions. So, have you seen um, momentum on the spot side? Have you seen willingness amongst customers to, um, you know, potentially move into the long-term area, or, um, you know, uh, uh, willingness to, to to pay a little bit more for for spot business? And um, just to, again, just to clarify, so it looks like your, your LTAs are in the $10,000 per ton range. Um, would you consider, uh, what's the strategy here? Are you, are you more interested in getting more of your customers onto some of those uh, LTA volumes, or are you interested in uh, broadening out the spot book, uh, given what you just said, as far as, um, you know, that you're very optimistic on, on upward momentum and pricing? Thanks. So um, just to um, you know, reiterate, um, you know, the LTA numbers that we're reporting are more like in the $9,500 range, just to uh, set that uh, table. But to answer your question directly on where we're heading, recognize that most of the LTAs that we're talking about today don't uh, mature until the end of next year. So. Our perspective it is it's a bit premature to begin discussions about <clears throat> something that won't come to uh, fruition until the end of 2022. It would be more natural for us, and our expectation is that as we get into uh, late August, you know, September next year, uh, so 12 months from now, 13 months from now, there'll be more discussions about. Um, 
the portfolio of products that we can bring to our customers, of which one of those products is absolutely LTX. And our expectation um, and uh, belief is that there will be some uh, customers that will want to do that. And we'll do the same thing as we did in 17. You know, it will be three and four and five year arrangements. Um, and we'll see how the market goes then. And you're, you're absolutely right. You caught us something. You know, we wouldn't normally go there until that time next year, but we're in a rising market right now. And I think both us and our customers will want to see, well, where does life take us over the next 12 months and what makes sense? And, um, you know, we've got uh, uh, hundreds of customers, so, you know, what may, they'll all have their own view on what best fits their uh, future. So I expect um, that we'll have, a, as we've had in the past, a mixture of both LTA and non-LTA business. And sorry, one last one, if I if I may, um, just want to get your thoughts on uh, Needle Coke. Um, you know, there's obviously been strong demand on the EV battery side as well. So, do you think the the Needle Coke market is tightening up as well? And and do you see that as uh, uh, likely, um, you know, inflation, you know, it, it coming in that market as well? And and is there any opportunity for for Graph Tech to participate in? Um, you know, businesses that are outside of electrode manufacturing, um, you know, is that something that, that, you know, is an opportunity for you at all in, 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 or you'd contemplate even? Thanks. Uh, Arun, I, um, you've hit uh, the, the nail right on the head there. There's, um, our belief would be, yes, the growing improvement in the graphite electrode market as well as the uh, movement towards EV, and you saw the announcement here in the United States that uh, the president has signed an order that um, policy that by 2030, half the vehicles sold by the automotive industry, you know, need to be non-carbon emitting, which implies EV. Um, so those pressures are all um, good from our perspective because it will and should have the um, effect of putting some pressure on the needle coke market and i'll remind you that we're two-thirds independent on needle coke this is an absolutely positive development for graph tech um, increasing prices on needle coke um, we are quite fine with um, largely because as you would know you know translates into pressure for our competitors to increase graphite electrode prices, which we're quite fine with, and then it increases our margins um, across, uh, particularly across the two thirds that we're self sufficient on. Which is exactly why I chose petroleum to be my revenue driver rather than steel. Glad to hear that he confirms my logic with that. We, we like our space. It may be their primary cost, but it's a primary cost that they can, in fact, pass on those costs to their customers in so it's effectively revenue us to provide the best returns to our shareholders great thanks your next question comes to the line of david gagliano with bmo capital markets hi good morning thank you for taking my question so i i wanted to drill down a little bit and just try and get a little more detail if possible please first of all third quarter um You've talked quite a bit about improving pricing. You've talked about how contracts or, or, or prices were negotiated back in uh, late 2020, early 2021 for the second quarter. So obviously, you know the price of the third quarter. Can you just tell us what the price is going to be for the uh, spot volumes that are uh, committed for the third quarter? That's my first question. And then the second question, which is related, if you could talk about volumes themselves and, and how we should expect uh, you know those volumes to compare to the second quarter. Um, and as we move into the fourth quarter as well, if you can talk about the volume expectations. That's, that's my first uh, set of questions. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, given that the dynamics of that, um, you're spot on. We, we know today what our third quarter um, numbers are going to be, and, you know, um, a reasonable portion even of the fourth quarter um, and we've always tried to be on this call uh, in our interface with uh, all of you 
transparent, but um, very clear in terms of guidance, et cetera, that, that we, we're not going to provide it. Um, but that's one of the reasons why when you hear me say we are very clear and uh, happy about where we think the second half will be in terms of pricing, it's not because we're estimating it. We know that. Um, and because of that confidence and that in the knowledge of it, we can say quite confidently that um, we are pleased with where the second half of the year is going to be with pricing and as well as the developments we start to see for the new year and um, not just in terms of what we've done, but the improved behavior of some of our competitors in that respect. Okay, well, I, I appreciate, first of all, I, 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 um, if you could just also give me a sense on the volumes, but just to come back on, on, the, on the pricing commentary again, I, I appreciate the fact that your confidence, and I'm not trying to, you know, confident, I'm not trying to question the confidence, I'm just really trying to help investors get a sense as to order of magnitude of improvement in pricing, which is very important to frame valuation and, you know, share price. So from a visibility perspective, it's important, I think, to at least give a sense as to where you think prices are going in terms of order of magnitude. For example, 4100 bucks a ton, should we assume over $5,000 a ton for the second half of this year, for the third quarter and into the fourth quarter? Is that a reasonable assumption or, you know, just at least help give us a framework and order of magnitude? would be very helpful. And then if you could also, again, comment on volumes ex volume expectations on an outright basis or relative to the second quarter. Thanks. Sure. Well, let me give you the, the last one first. On the volume side, um, you know, we had a pretty sizable increase in our volume um, in the second quarter and uh, running at a pretty high utilization rate. Um, and so as we... Um, move into the second half of the year. Um, I should point out, and um, we, we normally do this uh, every year in the third quarter, we have a, a short um, repair uh, schedule every year in the third quarter, repair outage at uh, uh, our, in our European facility, so that, that's no secret. And uh, then, then fully, that's only uh, you know, 10 days or so long, 10, 12 days long, 10 in one plant, 12 in another. And uh, then we go back into the fourth quarter, uh, you know, um, pedals of metal. So um, I think you'll see this at, at these higher volumes for the balance of the year and uh, at good utilization rates in our facility. I would, I would point out that we are seeing uh, increased demand for larger size electrodes that take a little bit more processing time. Uh, and I think that's uh, as the world is evolving to more, uh, I'll call it green EAS, that's probably not a surprise because these furnaces uh, tend to be the larger furnaces. You think through the new furnaces that are coming online in, in the United States, all of them are larger furnaces with larger graphite electrode sizes. Um, so it's not, um, you know, not a surprise as the world is improving and demand is improving and there's more EAS going towards flat roll applications that require larger furnaces that have, uh, and the larger furnaces by default have larger electrodes. Um, so uh, I think all of this is good. Part of the, uh, as you think about it, post COVID, uh, um, an expected uh, development as we move uh, through the next uh, you know, 12 months or so. On the pricing side, uh, just to do a bit of a, a gut check here, um, you know, if using your numbers would constitute a 20% increase in price in one quarter, That, that's a pretty big uh, that's a pretty big jump um, so um, there's, there's you know I recognize the steel guys have moved heaven and earth and they've, they've done some they've been successful in price increases that 
none of us ever imagined, okay? Um, I, I'm, I'm not, um, while I'm quite optimistic about where our performance on pricing is going, uh, I think, um, you know, 20% jumps a quarter are, are a little bit, uh, asking a little bit much. So um, I think uh, we're going to do darn good, uh, but I'm trying to uh, help calibrate you somewhat without getting too far over my skis. That hopefully that help that's helpful. Yeah, even that is helpful. Thank you very much for that calibration. And then just last question uh, from me: um, You mentioned obviously higher flow needle coat prices. It, maybe perhaps you can talk about um, order of magnitude on um, you know cost increases for the um, you know non self-sourced um, uh, petroleum needle coke uh, as we move through the second half of, of the year as well. Oh, sure, uh, Dave, this is Quinn. Yeah, we've talked about you know, the needle coke prices. We expect them to increase over time. They have increased over time. You know, the last numbers we gave was kind of a range of 1,300 to 1,800, and we were, were at the higher end of that range. We continue to see pressure on those prices and, and continue to see an, an upward trajectory, and we expect to continue to see that uh, into you know the, the first quarter, first half of next year. So absolutely, we're seeing upward pressure on, on those needle coke prices, um, and we'll, we'll know more when, uh, you know, when the, when the contracting, when the period to contract for, for the first half of next year comes around. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Kurt Woodworth with Credit Suisse. Thanks. Good morning, Dave and Quinn. Morning. Hey, Kurt. Um, you know, in, in the past, you, you have referenced some uh, data points with respect to needle coke pricing. I think maybe, maybe it's been import data. Is there, is there any color you can provide on, um, you know, where you see needle coke today um, for our models? So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting we were having discussions about, beginning to have discussions about next year, but nothing is uh, completely firmed up yet. I think on the last call, uh, Quinn, correct me if I'm wrong, we talked about 1,500-ish. Yeah, we talked about the high end of the range of, of our range, which was 1,300 to 1,800, and, and we were in the high end of that range. Yeah, and that was on the last call. You know, we, we made a few purchases, you know, earlier this year. Jeremy, you might want to talk about that a little bit. Yes, thanks, Dave. The, um, Kurt, we've, uh, uh, all of our commitments for this year uh, have already been sourced, and so pricing on those were set a while ago, so we don't have direct feedback in terms of, uh, in terms of pricing that we're seeing in the market. We will say that... Um, uh, we, we are seeing tightness. We know of the, um, uh, the winter storm that, uh, that affected us earlier in the year. We think that um, that may have had some impact on the industry in total. But uh, all of this is really kind of pointing us in the direction of tightening supply. And so as we look, at, as we look to the future, you know, as Quinn said, being at the high end of the range, uh, last time we made some purchases, uh, you know, I I don't see anything that's driving that would drive that down. Okay, um, and then back to to, to the pricing uh, discussion. I you know I, I appreciate you don't give guidance, um, but when you published the 10K, you did provide guidance of I think 4,100 for the first half of this year, um, back in February. So so there is some precedent on giving guidance to the street, and. You know, I think people really struggle with the opaqueness and transparency of this market. Um, so I think it would be helpful to think about giving more specific guidance as it pertains to non-LPA in the third quarter, but I accept, um, you know, it is what it is at this point. You know, one of the questions I have is, you know, clearly pricing is going up for needle coke and electrodes. And so to some degree, it's what matters is the spread between the two. Um, but theoretically, the coke could be going up faster than the electrode, which hypothetically negative. So I'm just curious, can, can you kind of talk to how you see relative scarcity value between electrode versus Coke? Um, would you expect your, you know, the spread to widen into the back half of this year? 
for your non-LPA? Yeah, so look, um, let me try again on the pricing to, to, to give everyone uh, as, as, as much as we can without, you know, <laughs> crossing over this uh, guidance line. I said to um, Dave earlier that a you know, 20% increase in a quarter would be pretty pretty awesome number that any industry would probably get. Um, and we're, I, you know, not likely that we're in that genre, but um, I will tell you, I can go so far as to tell you we've crossed over the double digit um, area. So that should narrow it for you a little bit. Uh, and I'm sorry, that's, a, that's about as far as I think we can go without, again, getting too far over our skis on pricing for, for the second half. Or yeah, that, that's helpful. Um, Great. You know, in terms of that spread, um, you know, again, we are in a bit of a unique position because we have so much of our, our own needle coke uh, that, um, you know, we're, we're in no danger of, uh, in, you know, net net of having our, our spread jeopardized by um, by needle coke this year. Um, and as Jeremy referenced earlier, we're just, we're just not far enough along in the 2022, uh, either graphite electrode uh, negotiations or needle coke. I don't expect that to be problematic candidly. Okay. And then just, just one last one. Um, obviously your, your utilization rates have gone up a lot. You know, the, the steel industry has, I, I assume a lot of your, uh, electro peers have as well. Do, do you have a sense for where the global utilization rate is today in the electro market? Um, and are you seeing any change in kind of competitive behavior from China? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that um, everybody's running pretty hard. Um, I can I can share with you, and I won't say who it is, but just this morning, you know, I, I, I had my. Uh, um, a weekly session with the commercial team and uh, you know we've got a couple of requests one from a pretty pretty uh, substantial customer that is you know asking for some help because uh, you know one of our competitors is uh, having a tough time staying with them uh, and we already supply them so you know we're going to uh, you know they're uh, we're going to move heaven and earth to give them a hand here. So to me, that's good news. Um, not that I wish bad on any of our competitors. It just tells me that everybody's running pretty hard and that uh, there's there's not a lot of room for, uh, you know, uh, for any issues or, or difficulties. In terms of the Chinese, I think we see the Chinese uh, domestic market moving forward. Uh, so I would expect, you know, they're always – slow to react to these kind of things, but uh, I think we will see that, that we see it in their home market, and uh, we certainly see uh, our broader competitive um, competitors, their behavior uh, changing uh, in the marketplace. Um, so there's, no, there's no question in our mind about that. Great. Thanks very much. Best of luck. Okay. Once again, if you would like to ask an audio question, press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from the line of Alex Hacking with City. Hi, uh, uh, morning, uh, Quinn and Dave. Not not to beat a dead horse on, on the pricing, but, um, you know, have, have prices been effectively going up steadily? Since January, you know, we're in August now. Has it sort of been a steady increase going up every week, every month? Um, and, and any sign of that upward pricing momentum stalling out yet? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's been perfectly linear. I would suggest that, um, you know, of late, it's, it's, it's probably uh, at a higher rate of change than it was you know, back in uh, uh, March and April. But, um, yeah, it, it, I, it, 
I think as soon as we got that inventory number in line at the end of the first quarter, we saw you know pretty much a, an ongoing improvement, and it's, it's picking up a bit of a head of steam. Okay, thanks. Um, I was going to ask about the inventory. So, um, you know, your view is the inventory today is is fully normalized. Oh yeah, it, it was pretty much for the fully normalized at the end of the first quarter. Okay, thanks. And then just one final one, uh, an accounting question. Maybe I'm I'm being dumb here, but um, the the 88 million of um, you know change of control costs. How much of that was in COGS and how much was in SGNA? You know, if I look at SGNA as 76 million, it seems like 55 million would be in SGNA and the rest in COGS. But if, if you could specify, that would be helpful for our model. Thanks. Yeah, sure, Alex. Uh, you're you're right on. It's 55.5 in SGNA and 32.5 in COGS. Perfect. Thank you so much. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of David. Got to specify the fixed cost versus the variable costs. Definitely not a stupid accounting question at all. From from Yoko, can you just comment on again some sort of framework around um, you know other other uh, input cost pressures if there are any and just order of magnitude what you're seeing there. Thanks. Yeah, sure, David. It's Quinn. So we talked a little bit about this last quarter. One of the things I mentioned was, you know, we were seeing increases in freight. That's no surprise. Freight costs have increased, I think, globally for, for everyone shipping anything. So we we did see, you know, headwinds with regards to freight costs in the quarter. Uh, that was probably the biggest single, um, you know, headwind with regards to cost. To a lesser extent, some uh, headwind on other raw materials. And then, of course, with the higher volume, we are using uh, more third-party needle coke. So those were all cost headwinds. On the other hand, we were able to benefit from the higher volume in that we had a lower fixed cost per metric ton. We could spread our fixed costs out over, over, over more volume. And that helped offset some of the headwinds that I just mentioned. So all in all, uh, our cash costs for the quarter were about one and a half percent higher than Q1. We felt good about our ability to maintain those. And you know, we'll continue to see headwinds going forward, certainly with freight, that tends to be a, a bit of a wild card, um, certainly with the with a, a higher usage of third party Neocoke. We'll do our best to continue to offset those uh, higher costs and, and those headwinds in, in the coming quarters. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. So, order of magnitude in terms of reasonable assumption moving forward outside of the petroleum needle coke line um, is sort of a one to two percent cost uh, quarter over quarter cost increase on um, you know per unit basis of reasonable expectation for for each of the next two quarters, or is it going to stabilize in your view? Yeah, like I said, it's freight is a bit of a wild card, but you know based on what we know, it's it's not you know it's probably not an unreasonable assumption with the caveat that you know freight really is a wild card. We're, we're seeing some you know, unusual increases there, but again, we're working very hard to manage those. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thank you. I would now like to turn the call back over to Mr. David Rentoul for closing remarks. Thank you, uh, Hillary, and thanks uh, to all that participated uh, for your questions and, and interest. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to wish everyone on the call uh, health and safety in the coming, month, coming months. Uh, we thank you for your interest in GraphTech International, and we look forward to speaking with you in the next quarter. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference call. You may now disconnect. <laughs>
have 52.6 over here. Is this actually wrong? Interesting. Just a moment. Eight thirty three eight oh five. On eight thirty three eight oh five, we don't actually get the liabilities. 351-901. 351-901. Long term debt, other long term liabilities, and deferred income taxes. You know, those are all fine. Okay, so then it's just that equity page that's got to be screwy. This, this, other community comprehensive loss, retained earnings, less both of these. Which means both of them should be listed as negative in regards to each other. We should get 104526. Okay, so there we go. I'm not even sure what I changed. <laughs> but whatever, we fixed it. Okay. A few more years to go. Oops, I'm screwing it up, screwing it up, screwing it up. Of the rationalizations. Rationalizations. It's the first time I've ever seen that term used. I'm kind of looking at that. Is that like a provision? I'm thinking it's got to be like, but I'm not really 100% sure. I'll have to look into that term later, which could be relevant for the new spreadsheet I'm trying to build. I miss like ten off. What did I miss? That's ten. Did I get the research and development? I did. Operating income sixteen. What did I screw up? Rationalizations. Oh. I'm seeing it now. This is AI. Near twenty three eighty six. Lord, always something where
depreciation, no selective, no amount of cash, uh, sum, change market capital. Receivables, inventories, prepaid expenses, that's it, 775 for current assets, now plant, equipment, simulation of depreciation, goodwill, Two hundred seven. I'm missing ten deferred income. Short-term debt plus accounts payable, which will count income taxes as part of other accrued liabilities plus this uh, rationalization item. Oh, and supply chain uh, financing liabilities. Um, they're calling it a financing liability, which uh, to me means it's debt. Long-term debt. Deferred taxes, other long-term obligations. Common share, excess capital, retained earnings or deficit. Treasury stock. And that gets us shareholders equity. Okay, two more years. Cost of sales, selling general and administrative. R&D. Interest income. Interest expense. Provision for taxes. Other income. 
am I missing? I'm missing this one, but. I had 156 for operating income. Nineteen, was that it? Yeah. All right, now diluted average share account. Depreciation and amortization. No non cash selective adjustments. Sum of change in working capital. Expenditures. Financing. All right, now the balance sheet, cash and equivalents, accounts receivable, inventories, prepaid expenses, Property, plant, and equipment, accumulated depreciation, goodwill, other assets plus deferred income taxes, short term debt, accounts payable, plus accrued income. Go back to the short-term debt and let's make sure we add in the financing liabilities. Now the other accrued liabilities. Now the long-term debt. Deferred income taxes liabilities and other long-term obligations. Now to the equity page. Thirteen forty nine equity. All right. Now on to the final final year. Selling general and administration. Research and development. Interest expense. 
interest income. Provision for taxes, other non-operating income. Diluted weight shares outstanding. Now to the cash flow statement. Depreciation and amortization. Net change in working capital. Capital expenditures. Cash from acquisitions. Net financing. And then you got repurchases and options. All right, now on to the final balance sheet. Cash and equivalents. Accounts receivable. Inventories. Prepaid expenses. Property, plant, and equipment. Term debt plus financing liabilities. Accounts payable plus accrued income taxes. Other accrued liabilities. Long term debt. Deferred income taxes and other long term obligations. Now, onto the final equity paid capital, retained earnings, comprehensive other. And net treasury. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. There. Busted out the rest of that. Got all 10 years. Good, good, good. Don't get too attached to this. Lots of things to do still. So, this is what we're looking at. Um, can't remember. I did go get all the stuff. I can't remember if I had actually got the information for... their dilution I'm pretty sure they did have kind of limited information in their 10k on that so we can just kind of go with what they have as the added effect of equity awards which is currently at about 14 million shares uh, so worst comes to worst we can kind of just rely on that number if necessary um, but I did also acquire um, didn't I acquire some information on their 
shares outstanding. Yeah, okay, here's some of the information from the options as well as some of the it's so like the normal options as well as the uh compensation options but i couldn't really find much on the restricted shares or at least not anything that matched up again like i said because if you look at their i try to make sure it's like my own share account if i'm at whatever dilutive effect i add to it it's like i don't need it to be exactly the same as what the company says but it should be in the ballpark you know it's like unless you have a specific thing that you're like oh no this is why my dilution effect is going to be much stronger or much less than what they're reporting you got to have a, a, a good reason for it um so that's that's the complication part oh whoa, 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 whoa. never mind i said 14 million it's not 14 million more shares it's 14,000 more shares because this is millions right here actually so actually yeah my bad i they're saying there's almost no dilution whatsoever um so actually maybe these do match up i i was reading that in the wrong scale because if you add restricted stock units here plus the outstanding uh, options then i end up with a total of eight hundred fifty-eight thousand. um and then there is also This number, which is nine hundred and six thousand, um, so I have a feeling in their dilutive effect that they are actually counting the uh, they are counting the options, but I don't think that they're counting the restricted stock. Oh wait, no, actually, I have, I have that I have that reverse. They are counting the restricted stock, but I don't think they're counting the options. Let's see, because this gets me to 47,000. Yeah, I think I'm going to use the 47,000. Now, it barely adds anything, so it doesn't really matter. It's all that much. It's not going to affect the value all that much, but whatever. I'm going to do what I got to do. Um, all the other factors are in place. I already did their segmentation. I already did their um, the revenue uh, dispersions. And disaggregation already did their book debt with 5.67 percent weight average book debt with three years outstanding based off the paid debt i'm getting a 6.74 percent not a huge divergence that's okay i can go ahead and just leave that in place um the corrected uh effective tax rate through your aggregate is only about seven percent which is a little weird um i do think that comes from the back of lots of deferred losses so it's, it's perhaps arguable that they will manage to sustain that for some time but in the long run we would expect it to probably coast upward a little bit which incidentally actually helps them because that's this effect is only used for the discount rate primarily uh, i i how the taxes actually affect the margin i just do independently down here which we still have to get to um as you can see right here they've been averaging for the last three years significant margins and so we only have really low margins right here that's part of the reason the price is extraordinarily low so once we adjust for those things, it'll probably correct itself. But I'm trying to look at some other factors first. Either way, looking at the um, the projections of revenue, uh, we end up with uh, a set of outcomes of, of growth rates right here, which comes to a distributed level of negative 1.78% per year. So that's what we're projecting is that they were the revenues will actually decline on average 1% to 2% per year for the next two years, um, which... Uh, again, they've grown rather dr dramatically in the last few years. So if they maintained that, that would still be a huge increase compared to where they were a few years ago, but it wouldn't be growth. Um, but that does, I think, give us a pretty good uh, conservative baseline from which to judge our valuation. Um, based off of those growth rates and the, the formulas that I like to use, this gives us a suggested sales to capital ratio of 1.35 to 1.92. Um, why is this one so 
Whoa, hold on a second. Oh, I don't actually have a price listed in here. That's part of the issue. Um, hold on. Sixty-two does not make sense. All right, there we go. I don't know why I automatically had this in here as yes when there was a uh, no there. Um, but whatever, we corrected it. Found the problem. I was a little confused as to why it was doing that. But there we go. That gets us the correct answer. The analyst output comes to 1.1 billion, which actually gets us a distributed sales outcome of a little bit less than 1% per year. A little bit better. So that makes a bit more sense. So then on the distributed basis for uh, sales cap ratio, so this gets us. Uh, uh, formula output of 1.35 to 1.92, but I don't usually hard lock to these outputs, so we'll adjust these a little bit based off some expectations, as well as margin assumptions of anywhere from 15% to 100%. Obviously, 100% doesn't make any sense, so it's like the formula is a little bit loose and stuff, but we, it's a, uh, it, it's just showing us the uh, the sensitivity of margins relative to the increase in revenues, uh, so it can't actually go to 100%, but uh, interesting that that formula outputs that way. Uh, so for margins, maybe 15% is a good base point uh, low. Um, maybe not because like I said, we're not going to go to 100%. Let's maybe use 50% actually as the the true cap there. But 5% um, is also perhaps a good low point. Uh, it gets us to a midpoint of 27.5. Again, la average of the last few years has been 40%. But if you go to a long term average, it ends up more like 13%. Um, if we go to nine years, it, it drops even more uh so oh, i need to yeah so it's only become extraordinarily profitable in the most recent few years that's just something that has to be taken into account uh,
fifty percent for the height, I guess. It's so half as much as what the output's putting us, and then negative five because I like to suggest that it goes to a loss. If it really does reach a, a low point of uh, that point, then they won't be able to uh, sustainably output the product. As far as the number that I'd put in place for the analyst, maybe 20%, 15%. Obviously, it's suggesting a really high number, but this is being a little screwy. Because I don't usually run too closely off these. These are just like suggestions based off of a formula I came up with um, that I like use as at least a, a base point to think about but it's not really all that meaningful. It's much more meaningful to look at where they've been at historically and where they're headed towards towards the future. As you can see, the sales cap ratio was extraordinarily low until 2018, and then it's been pretty high since then. It is dropping, um, but it's still extraordinarily high. So, I mean, easy to see it maybe coming back to an average between those things. So it may be dropping below sub one in the, uh, the longer course of things. Uh, again, it's like you look at their their industry and you can kind of uh, expect as much. Um, but obviously the high points, you might want to capture the potentiality for those high points as well. That brings us to 0.96, which would be a dramatic dropping from where we are currently, but I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption to make over the course of it like this is where they're currently at so it's like it would slowly drop over this so the suggestion that 1.28 becomes 0.96 over course i think is not unreasonable because it is probably unreasonable that it would go to 25 but it's also unreasonable that it would stay at 1.75 indefinitely so you could argue that that's maybe a more a slightly more conservative way to put it Then there's debt to equity ratio to handle. Wow, did I really? I'm not incredibly off on this, am I? How come my that level listed is so much higher? Must have screwed up something there. Oh, it's probably like a scale thousand somewhere. Hold on. Yeah. This is probably supposed to be divided by a thousand. I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, okay. I was gonna say 200% debt to equity ratio. I was like, I don't, I don't remember looking at them and thinking they were super levered. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> okay, that makes much more sense. All right, so that drops their cost of equity down to 10%. It's actually 43% debt to equity ratio currently. Weight average cost capital 5.77. Uh, we'll probably readjust a few more other things because I was kind of taking those those assumptions into account. Um, anyway, but let's let's think about it. We have the, our default setup kind of assumes maybe about a 45%. So it's actually kind of already in line with a, a pretty re reasonable range of assumptions in my opinion based off of that. I do think it's unlikely that they would reach a 0% debt. So we can probably say that that's unlikely. Maybe drop it to 20, 15% or something. Um, and then 100%, well, 
if we're presuming that their market capitalization gets cut in half and they're already at 43 percent and if it gets doubled that'd be to 85 percent and then if they issued a little bit more it could be higher than 100 percent uh, so 100 percent is perhaps a reasonable range to assume that brings the expectation to 52 percent um but they have been delevering they've been talking about delevering so the assumption that they're going to continue delevering is also reasonable to assume so maybe drop it slightly bit more that puts them at 51 percent which i'm generally okay with assuming that they're going to increase their debt to equity ratio a little bit um over the next few years so that's okay um let's see what else is there to think about? There's returns invested capital for the last three years, 27.85% after adjusting for uh, the negative uh, return retained earnings that they currently have. It's actually saying that it should be twice as much as that, um, but I cut it in half whenever, uh, whenever I have this sort of scenario. So, 27.85 is what we're seeing as their effective uh, returns on invested capital, which does give them extraordinarily high uh, excess returns. Um, their distributed returns of invested capital stays around the 27% range um, as a result of that, uh, which I find fascinating that it comes out to be the same number that I get over here after I cut that number in half. And it's like, that's kind of just an arbitrary decision, but yet, but this is not an arbitrary decision because this is based off of the returns we're projecting based off of the capital investment that we're already seeing. So that actually makes me feel really good about that kind of arbitrary decision that I do over here when I see that this is actually the number that it outputs over here. It's like, it's, it's interesting how those are actually remotely close to each other. Um, but whether or not we want to adjust the margins a little bit more or something else, it's like you could maybe argue that this could be a little bit worse to make some of these uh, outcomes a little bit lower. That brings us uh, the expected margin down to uh, net margin 19. Um, I am being extra conservative with this one, partially just because of the, the odd range of outcomes that they're likely to get because of their commodity and because of the oddness in the way that the commodity affects their business. Like I said, they're not selling a commodity. It's actually a commodity that's their main cost, but they get to pass on those costs as part of their uh, pricing. So because of that, I'm a little hesitant to kind of use, um, to, 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 be, to be less conservative than I am, I guess. Um, so we're being really conservative in our sales and capital ratios. We're trying to be really conservative in our margin assumptions, but it does feel like they would have uh, pretty high margins probably going forward, probably in the 20% range, I think. So that's why I feel okay with these these assumptions, but you do have to take it with a grain of salt. They probably won't do terribly in both the sales to capital ratio and the met margin ratio. Um, they're both relatively high, but it's probable that, that these things would alter a bit. See, like as you can see here, the sales to capital ratio for the business is actually high. So you could argue that that will remain that way. And if that remains that way, that's awesome. If their met margins drop rather dramatically, but their sales to capital ratio stays high, well, then the returns will probably still outcome as one of these sort of midpoint outcomes fact leaning towards more of the positive end of things um, but so if net margins come down but sales to capital ratios stay high that can make a big big difference oh, of course that didn't do that but that's because of other factors sales to capital ratio by raising the sales to capital ratio we're actually uh raising the total capital that's uh we're required for that and we actually have a negative margin on that so there's there's a reason that that outcome outcome came the way it did but so maybe negative five in the worst case scenario and maybe bring this down to 45 that's probably the extreme outcome that's pushing it um and then maybe push this back up to 15 because that's probably being a little bit too punishy for the analyst uh assumption 
and then maybe bring this up to 0.5. Maybe we'll leave that there, but actually edge this up a little bit further instead. Yeah, I'm not sure there's much else that I feel comfortable doing with this one. That might be about it. I'm not entirely pleased with a lot of the assumptions that I have with this and definitely don't feel overly confident with it. But as you can see, um, even with shifting some of those numbers around, we still just kind of end up in this range where it's like anywhere from negative 10% to positive 10%. It's just, it's not, it's not really that, you know, not that much of a divergence. It's mostly fair value, give or take. Give or take a year, seems like the stock's fair value. Um, regardless of how you shift around the ends of these assumptions, it doesn't really seem like it's gonna matter much. It's not It's not so different that it's like, hmm, are we looking at a 15% return or a 20% return? It's like, well, we're still looking at beta returns, no matter how you spell it, so. So that might be it. We'll adjust for the default risks and we'll call it a day. So in the most recent year, they have 7%. Oh, let's look at their debt versus cash levels. Okay, never mind. They'll be issuing lots of debt. Okay, I think that is it. Uh, so, EAF, ticker EAF, GraphTech International. Uh, today, the US Treasury is selling for around 1.53%. Uh, the mature market equity risk premium comes to a 4.71%. For this particular company, after adjusting for company-specific idiosyncratic risks, I come to a discount rate of 10.03%. They currently have a 0.3% dividend that they're paying out. Five years ago, they had sales of $533 million. In the most recent year, it was $1.2 billion, which comes to a sales growth for the last five years of about 18% per year, which is pretty impressive. They have sales to capital ratio of 1.6, uh, 
compared to industrial expectations of 1.77. Uh, with this, they actually have pretty high returns on invested capital of 27.85%, um, and they achieve this on a debt to equity ratio of 43%. Their debt to their debt default risk in the most recent year was approximately 1.07%, and they achieved a profit margin after adjusting for R&D of 40.59%, compared to an industrial expectation of 9.32%. Uh, so generally, their industry, we would expect them to have the highest sales to capital ratio with a low profit margin. They have relatively high of both, which is a very strong qualitative competitive uh, factor uh, when you see that both of them are high together. They had profit in the most recent year, $435 million, and they're currently selling for the price of $13.31 per share. We are using an uh, even probability distribution, which is what we use when we use a uh, commodity price model uh, for correlating our revenues. Uh, and so with that, we have sales uh, driver of oil or petroleum, and we have oil five-year price expectations of anywhere from $27 per barrel to $183 per barrel. On an expected basis, we are assuming about an $80 per barrel price in the five-year forward period. But again, we're uh, distributing all those outcomes evenly. We are price agnostic when it comes to commodities uh, pricing in the future, regardless of our own views on where those commodities are likely to go. But either way, expected oil price of $80 per barrel five years from now. Um, based off that, we get sales expectations of $974 million in the worst case scenario to possibly $1.6 billion in the best case scenario, uh, which on an expected basis comes to $1.1 billion. Um, and sales expectation growth of almost negative 5% in that worst case scenario to a little bit more than 5%, almost 6% in the best case scenario. On an expected basis, a little bit less than 1% down per year for the next five years. We do have sales capital expectations for them of about one. So we do expect that if they do achieve a significant amount of sales, they'll probably have to do a large amount of investments to achieve that, regardless of their recent uh, successes in that. But that could be one area in which we are being extraordinarily conservative because they used to have really low sales capital ratios and then they've dramatically increased it in the last few years. You don't usually see companies shift it that dramatically. And so that's why I'm, I'm a little hesitant to assume that high sales capital ratio is going to stay in the future and so i'm dropping it rather dramatically which again could be me being very conservative um, returns of vested capital we do uh, expect them to relatively keep over the the long run on an expected basis we're uh we are assuming that they'll achieve 26.41 percent so really they only lose a little bit of their returns of vested capital and then we do expect them to likely ish, um, issue more debt in order to achieve those revenues and those returns going up to maybe an expected basis of 47%. Uh, and we do think that that does give them a pretty significant amount of default risk, mostly in those worst case scenarios. And so that weighs in a little bit heavier, um, but it does come to about 3.48% per year, which is relatively high default risk. But again, it's a little it's a little misleading. It's actually not as bad as all that. Um, but, but it's worth noting that, that, that if they do have to issue more debt to achieve those revenues, that there is some risk associated with that. And then we also are assuming that their profit margins drop rather dramatically um, as a result of the distribution of their profit outcomes uh, to possibly around 19%. But it is a little bit misconstrued because of the distribution of the uh, of outcomes that we have over here. So it does overly weigh some of the negatives in there. But we do think the really high profit margins and the really high sales to capital ratio, I, I just don't believe the two of those things can last together indefinitely. Um, so even assuming that they achieve a, a one sales to capital ratio and a 19% profit margin, those two are already still pretty strong together. Like that's still pretty good. Um, so again, I'm probably being conservative. One of these things might come true. Probably not both of them. Uh, the other one will probably do better, in my opinion. It's like, I wouldn't be shocked if this ended up being 0.75 and this ended up being 30%. Or if this ended up being one and this ended up being 20%, you know, it's like th th those things make sense to me in general. That's how I think about companies is that these two um, particular measures usually are not high together. If they are high together, it means you have a very strong competitive position. You have a very strong competitive advantage or you have some sort of regulatory something protecting you 
or something. Um, in this case, I think it's that they they have a very um, unique uh, form of uh, process that isn't done by a lot of other people, and there was a high demand for that process in the most recent years, as well as the supply chain issues, a lot of the stuff that they covered in their con conference call. But either way, the point is I, I'm going into such detail here to make it clear just how conservatively I value this particular stock, just because I think there's a lot of complications and uncertainties associated with it. So I had to value it that particular way. Either way, we get a profit um, outcome distribution of anywhere from a loss of $50 million in the five-year forward period to possibly a profit of $721 million. On an expected basis, we're seeing uh, possibly $259 million, uh, which gets us a present value expected price based off the discount rate that we're using of $12.35 per share, which is 7% overvalued from the current price. Uh, we do have five-year forward value targets unadjusted for the dividends that they paid out of anywhere from $2.68 per share to $52.17 per share. Um, and on an expected basis, we would assume about a price of $19.91, which based off the price that's currently selling, would get you an implied return for the next five years of 8%, 8.38% per year for the next five years. Um, we don't actually have an analyst five-year EPS growth rate to input. So uh, the short-term pricing metric is uh, outputting something that isn't really all that meaningful right now. Um, and the value score, I do get them for them, even though they're overvalued and have not amazingly high absolute returns, I still get a pretty decent value score of 0.97, mostly because of the, uh, like I said, high qualitative factors. But those same high qualitative factors are, uh, I'm being rather skeptical of as far as uh, their ability to sustain in the future. So that kind of gets us to the value that you see here. So that's what I get for Graph Tech. I do think it's a very, very interesting company, a very great business model and an interesting, uh, interesting place in the economy to, to definitely have a position. But unfortunately, I do think the price is a little high right now. Uh, mostly, like I said, it's... <sighs> Compared to where I, if I was to bet on one outcome for this stock, I bet it's undervalued. I, I'm willing to bet that. I'm willing to bet that the outcomes are somewhere in here. Okay. It's like, I think maybe like the, maybe like the a worst case scenario is, is actually here but I'm kind of being extra conservative and weighing in a really worst case scenario. And I think that this is pretty likely of an outcome, at which point you wouldn't lose money over the five year period. And I think this is very likely, not maybe very is a strong word compared to pretty, but pretty likely, but even more pretty, pretty likely. It's a double pretty likely. So um, either way, and if that was the case, then this would definitely be undervalued. So that's what I'm, I'm saying is like, I actually do think the stock is undervalued, but I think that some of the risks involved with it means that you really ought to be weighing in some even worst case scenarios, which means you should be demanding an even higher return. Uh, so essentially, even though I do think it is undervalued today, uh, the value that I'm gonna choose to ascribe to it is a little bit a little bit lower than that because I do think that you have to weigh in worst case scenarios. Because I personally, for example, think that oil prices will be at $80 in five years from now. I think there's a good chance it'll be at $100 five years from now. Uh, but I don't know that. And you kind of have to assume that maybe you're wrong when it comes to oil prices because who knows? It could be $50 five years from now or it could be $25 five years from now. So you kind of have to not should necessarily run on everything that you automatically assume. So either way, waxing philosophically at this point, uh, we'll basically call it a day. This is uh, Graph Tech. Like I said, very, very interesting company, high quality company, a well run company as far as I can tell and based off of the things that matter to me, but it is a little bit pricey as far as wanting to add it to the profile today. So. That's going to do it for us today. I'm not sure um, which company we're going to be looking at on Monday. I know that um, before doing Scandinavian Tobacco on Wednesday, I had mistakenly said that, that that particular ticker was going to be another Australian gold miner, but that's actually the next one on our list 
uh, now because I did double check on that already. So whether or not I'm going to move on to that one next or uh, the other American company that was left over on those the last two on that list, they're there. Or we're going to move on to the next uh, set of companies in our new screen that we uh, had put together. Uh, not sure yet. Well, I'll decide over the weekend. But either way, I will catch you all again on Monday around the time the market closes. That's uh, when we stream. We usually stream three times a week around the mon around the time the market closes on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So I'll catch you all again on Monday.